pleased to welcome Hasib Qureshi, Managing Partner at Dragonfly Capital, to talk about investing, technology, and the intersection of those two spaces in crypto. Hasib, welcome to Real Vision. Thanks for having me, Ash. Great to be here. Really excited about this conversation. We were talking a little bit off camera. You bring together uh, an expertise on the investing side and at the technology level uh, of this space, and that's rarely seen uh, in one person. First, before we get started, give us a sense of the fund. Give us the overview, the 50,000-foot takeaway on what you guys are doing at Dragonfly. Yeah, so at a high level, um, so we're crypto VCs. We invest in early-stage technology that results in the the sort of universe of crypto tokens, exchanges, brokerages, all the stuff that you see today in the blockchain and crypto universe. So we're we're pretty early investors in this stuff. I've been investing since 2017 professionally in this space. And, um, you know, in our, our first fund was $100 million. Our second fund was $250 million. We've got now over $2 billion in AUM that Dragonfly manages. And um, we're early partners with a lot of the preeminent protocols and, and companies that we've uh, backed in our portfolio. So just to give you a sense of some of them, you know, so I was an early investor into Avalanche, Mina, uh, Compound, DYDX, One Inch, Uma. Um, so, we, you know, our investments kind of run the gamut with both the exchanges, the protocols, DeFi, NFTs, gaming. Uh, we sort of touch everything. So that's what we do at a very high level. And as you mentioned, we're also quite, quite technical. Um, so, you know, my background before I got into crypto, I was a software engineer. I was previously at Airbnb before I, I came into crypto investing in earnest. And so, um, you know, I come to the space as a technologist. And the way that I understand um, the, the value creation in crypto is that a lot of it comes from foundational innovations in technology. You know, Bitcoin itself was a computer science innovation and a distributed systems innovation just as much as it was a monetary innovation. And so um, we think of ourselves as multidisciplinary investors. We study computer science, economics, cryptography, uh, and we bring all that to bear in the way that we think about investing. In fact, you could probably argue that the monetary innovation of Bitcoin would have been completely impossible without the technological innovation uh, to build on. That's exactly right. I mean, in the early Internet, there were a lot of people who thought about what would it take to create digital money that would exist purely uh, outside of any connective tissue with the traditional financial system. And originally, not that many people remember this, but originally PayPal was actually trying to create their form of digital money without having to get a banking license or connect to traditional banking infrastructure. Um, and they eventually realized with enough conversations with regulators that that was going to be a non-starter. Uh, they didn't have the notion of a decentralized form of money back then. But um, it, was, it was with the, you know, it was in 2007, 2008, in the advent of the great financial crisis that Satoshi put the pieces together that had been brewing for many, many years to create Bitcoin as this decentralized form of money that could do the thing that you and I are talking about, which is be this decentralized monetary experiment, which has now become, you know, over a, over a trillion dollars in value. Yeah. We're going to get into more of the technological details uh, as this conversation continues. Uh, but when you run into a traditional investor, someone who says to you, Hasib, you know all about this stuff. Uh, I'm a person who's invested in uh, in traditional capital markets assets for years. I look at the price of Bitcoin. I look at the price of Ethereum. I don't really understand why it's going up, but I see that these prices are going parabolic. Mm -hmm. What's your explanation? Big picture, uh, 50,000 foot for what's happening in the space. Well, so there, there's two ways to answer that question. So the first way is like, why are prices going up? And the second question is, okay, why? Sure, they're going up, but like, why is this the price level? The second question is much harder. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that second. The first question of why are prices going up? There, there are a couple of big answers to this, uh, to, to, to this question. So the first one, of course, is what's happened since COVID. And uh, I'm sure there's something that you guys have, have covered in, in much depth on Real Vision, but um, the, the enormous amount of monetary printing has... Uh, you know, for, for for a while, people within the crypto universe, and I imagine on your show as well, have been uh, have been saying that look, inflation is a real risk with the rate of monetary uh, supply expansion that's going on right now, and you're seeing this in a bunch of different countries, and it's finally hitting the dollar as well, and people realize now, okay, this this is one inevitable, uh, but two, what what you're seeing on a macro level is a flight to the scarcest assets, and. Those scarce assets, you know, in crypto, the most scarce asset that you can find is Bitcoin. 
it is an asset that is actually immune to inflation. There is no way to inflate Bitcoin beyond the uh, the sort of distributed system uh, that determines exactly how much Bitcoin gets minted on a day-to-day -day basis. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. Never another one will ever get created. And that is, is a big reason why there's been so much uh, eagerness and demand for uh, getting into the Bitcoin economy. Now, of course, Bitcoin is only one half the story. Uh, you know, uh, crypto's closing in on $3 trillion in uh, total market capitalization. And uh, only you know, one and change is Bitcoin. The rest is everything else, all the other things that have been created in this space. And uh, people see the rise of what's going on with NFTs, with DeFi, uh, enormous amounts of capital and enormous amounts of users are onboarding into this new decentralized movement. And at this point, the writing's on the wall. I think most institutions back in, uh, you know, call it, mid 2020 2020 uh, I'm sorry back in mid 2020 many institutions saw what was happening and thought okay does this thing have staying power is it going to be real um, over the course of 2020 more and more consensus has been built you know when you see these traditional companies banks financial institutions pensions starting to put this stuff on their balance sheet now you're starting to see the, the this you know we're we're seeing it because we're chatting with a lot of these institutional allocators um, there's an enormous amount of capital that's starting to find its way into crypto where, you know, before in 2020, people talked about, okay, maybe we can have 1% exposure in our, uh, on our balance sheet into crypto. Now you're starting to talk like two, three, 4% for many really, really significant institutions realizing they need a crypto strategy. This stuff isn't going away. It's becoming even bigger. Uh, and that is, is a large part of the catalyst of why crypto has, has been meteoric in its rise over the last year. Yeah, I mean, you're discussing a sort of a broad-based fusion uh, of the crypto world uh, with traditional capital markets, traditional commerce and business more generally. That's right. That's right. Now, the second part of your question is, okay, well, why is Bitcoin worth 60000 and not 30000 And there, that's a, it's, it's a much harder question to answer because, of course, you know, you might also ask the question of, okay, you know, why is Amazon a $2 trillion company instead of a $1 trillion company? And, you know, why, why is the marginal dollar of revenue being valued here as opposed to there? And there, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I find actually when I chat with these uh, traditional investors, um, I ask them the same question about, okay, why are commodities priced where they are? Why, is, why are equities priced the way they are? Why is the, uh, you know, and, and the answer is most of the time it's relative. It's relative to other assets they see in the market. It's relative to how everybody else is pricing risk in, in capital markets. And today, the reality is that in a universe that's starved for growth and that's starved for finding some kind of yield in an environment where interest rates are, are basically non-existent, um, that is one thing that crypto offers that most people recognize, is that it's one of the few areas that everybody knows is going to grow. It's one of the few things that everybody realizes is going to have more and more product market fit over time, especially, you know, just, just even looking at Bitcoin as a macro asset. Uh, as we become increasingly concerned about uh, the U.S. dollar, uh, one, becoming uh, more and more subject to inflation, which for a long time people had a kind of magical thinking about the dollar that, OK, well, you can print as much as you want and there will just be infinite demand for, for the U.S. dollar. And who cares whether or not, you know, the, the, the U.S. will ever make good on its debt? Um, people are now seeing, they're like, no, 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 that's not how it works. Uh, there's a, there's a, a certain amount of printing you can do, but at, at a certain point, you know, it's like a, it's like a company uh, potentially entering bankruptcy. You can borrow and borrow and borrow, and for a long time people will assume you're good, but then you hit this tipping point, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you, we start being worried about bankruptcy. And in the same way, the U.S. dollar is starting to hit that inflection point, and that's what drives a lot of this demand for crypto assets is that in a, in a multipolar world where the U.S. dollar is losing or potentially starting to uh, drip away some of its status as being the global dominant reserve currency, uh, crypto is the natural thing that fits into that multipolar world. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.